All right. Uh, our very first question is, we need you guys to approve a design. Oh, my gosh. Uh-oh. I like oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like that. All right. Let's get it. You couldn't get your design guy on it, so I got my design guy yeah. on it. Man. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so that will be available at the church website. Man, if you did that, <laughs> you talk about people coming at you. Only thing missing is the reference to Acts 17, 26. That's the only thing missing to give it context. We'll have that by the end of the session. Yeah, you got that. <laughs> Way to go, Jim. I like that. All right. Yeah. All right, first question. I'm going to try and go through the ones that we've got from the audience here so far. You can take that down. You don't need to get that. <laughs> Somebody's probably taking a picture and then shout it out on social. It'll be a whole nother <clears throat> issue tomorrow when you, you guys in. can deal with that. Yeah, we can handle it. We can handle right, from your book about the state, your chapter on elections and going into the voting booth with a biblical worldview was absolutely relevant. I use the information talking with others over and over. Have you thought of printing this in a way that we can hand it out to people to educate them before elections? Oh, well, uh, we have... Uh, the, the actual episode that, 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 that was the catalyst for the chapter. One of the things that we did as a, as a part of the process to putting the book together, we, we actually took the sections from the, um, our, we started with the transcripts from the, uh, the, the actual episodes. And then from that, we would build out whatever we needed and then would edit it and, and make sure that it read in a way that you weren't reading the podcast, but that you were reading a book as if you were sitting down and we were talking directly to you. So the, the, the goal of the process was for to, to, to look like that, sound like that, read like that. And for the most part, I think, um, between us and the editors, they, they did a fantastic job. It was a kind of collaborative effort. If you want to take that portion separately and give it to someone, I would just encourage you to do that. I mean, you could go back and, and actually get the episode. I don't remember what number it was. Like yeah, I don't remember what number episode or, that was. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. 105. 105. I would just get that. That knows your podcast better yeah. than you guys do. I would just... <laughs> I would just go grab that episode and send it to someone for them to, to listen to and think about separately uh, so that you don't have to buy the whole book. But yeah, I, would also encourage, I would also encourage the purchase of the book because it is a, it, it, it's a compendium of, of information that will be helpful year after year after year. We, we, we wrote it so that it could be a resource uh, for someone to use over and over. We had a, a, a conversation with, with one of the... the um, the, the, the folks who, who put the publisher who put the book together, they said, well, here's what sales are doing. Da, da, da. My thought is every election cycle with regard to this book, you should see a, a spike in sales as people begin to think about how should I think about this issue or that issue biblically? And, and the hope would be that they would pick up that book and it would be helpful. Yeah, I was just going to mention real quick, in the book, the chapter is titled just Elections. But on the podcast, the episode is titled The Doctrine of Elections. Uh, but they shortened the title of it in the book, uh, the table of contents. But if you're going to go listen to the episode, it's episode 105. But the title is The Doctrine of Elections. Yeah. Do you want to tell a little bit about what we covered in that? I mean, the reason I mentioned that is simply because uh, if, if you are reformed and you hear Doctrine of Elections, you're, you're actually thinking about soteriology, right? And that's not what we cover. Uh, it is actually about a play on words. Yeah, it's a play on that. It's a play on the words, and, and the thought process is, you know, what what kind of a worldview do we need to have as we go into the election booth? What kinds of things should we be thinking about? How should we be thinking about issues biblically speaking as we approach an election? The election. Yeah, that episode is like a three-hour biblical primer on how to vote. And what I'm most proud of in the work that we, Virgil and I did in that episode is that we went three hours. We didn't name a single political candidate by name, and we don't mention a single political party by name. But we give you three hours of biblical precepts and principles, uh, which we hope would encourage you to, to go into the voting booth with a biblical worldview uh, so as to not be, a, so we wouldn't be in the position of being accused of being biased or whatever. Uh, we don't mention any candidate by name, no political party by name, and three hours worth of content. So that episode is evergreen, as Virgil just said. Uh, in, in, you know, coming up on a, a minor or major election cycle, you should send that episode out to everyone you know Absolutely. and have them listen to it. That would be helpful. All right, the amount of material resources and books that you two read for your podcast is immense. How do you find time to do that research and how do you schedule that in? One of the reasons why we don't do the podcast every week is for that very reason. 
Um, and and Daryl can walk through a little bit of how we uh, process each subject. But every time we, we begin a, a portion of the research, we've just got to do it as we go. We have to consider, okay, we've got travel schedules, uh, we've got work. We've got day jobs. Uh, yeah, we've got, we got day families. jobs so that we've got to take care of. So we really are, are processing all of those things. And we won't, we won't do an episode until we feel like we fully vetted the, the, um, the, the, the subject. One of the things that really caused, I think, an, an, an elevation or an increase in, uh, in, in the amount of research that goes into each episode for, for me at least, and Daryl could speak to this himself, it was who was listening. It was who was listening, right? Initially, it was just me and Daryl, we were having a good time, maybe a couple hundred people, but when it gets to 10,000 and then 20,000 and then 50,000 episode and then 80,000 and then 100,000 plus, I'm thinking, that's a whole lot of folks who are listening. And, and many of them, while many of them are, are, are favorable uh, to what we say and do, there are a number of them who are not. Can I, can I interject real quick right here? Speaking of, speaking of a number of them that are not, it's not a large number, but the small number, there's a small number. What I'm recalling right now for uh, uh, a person who shall remain anonymous. They left us a, rev a negative review on uh, Apple iTunes, on Apple Podcasts. They left us a negative review. They accused us of being too articulate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. That review said we were too articulate. He gave us a one star. Yeah. One star out of five because he said we were too articulate. So, was it Joe Biden? He once said yeah. Barack Obama. <laughs> was clean and clean. clean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so we, as we begin thinking about who's listening, it's imperative that we get things right. And and Daryl spoke to this earlier. That's important to us, right? If, if I'm if I'm quoting something to you from uh, someone who's uh, who has a different worldview, I want to be honest about uh, about what they're saying, what they're doing, how they're believing. And so again, you'll hear us try to quote from original resource material because we want to be accurate in what's mm -hmm. said. And, and doing that takes time. It's more than just a quick Google search and you got it and, and pop and go. Um, you've got to buy these books at times and read through them and unpack them. So that takes time. So our hope is that with each episode, you come away feeling like, wow, if I hadn't listened to that, there's no way I would have had the time uh, to go research that and know that apart from these guys spending the time, taking the time and dissecting it uh, for us and then pushing whatever the issue is through a biblical worldview. And so that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the thought process. It, it takes a while. Uh, right now, we're, we, we, we're, we're trying to average about one episode per month. And I think this is the first time that it's going to be a little bit of It's going to be a little bit delayed space. because of our travel schedule for the month of June. So we have to push the next episode out to the middle of July. Yeah. yeah. But to just give you guys some background, the first kind of alluded, uh, alluded to this, give you guys some background on, on about how we, how we do what we do. <clears throat> Usually, th th there's nothing scientific or complicated about it. If there's a, a topic or an issue or a theme that's burdening one of our hearts, we'll just send a text, me text message. Out and uh, like Virgil, for instance, for the episode that's coming up, the one that we're going to be releasing in middle middle of July, is uh, titled "Cultural Denominationalism." Virgil sends me a text and uh, says, "Hey, I think we should do one on, on denominationalism," and I text it back. I said, "Political denominationalism." He said, "Yeah." Then I, a couple days later, I was dwelling on that. I said, "Nah, political denominationalism is too narrow." I said, "What about cultural denominationalism?" He said, "Let's do it." So I got to work. Uh, so that's usually how we agree on a topic or, or, or an issue for an episode. It's just a couple of text messages, maybe a phone call it's real quick. We'll nail it down after a few seconds, and then that's my cue to go get to work. Mm -hmm. For this upcoming episode, episode 119, on cultural denominationalism, if you want to make a note, we're tentatively, tentatively scheduling that release uh, for July 13th, Wednesday, July 13th. I went out and bought 12 books on denominationalism. Uh, to study and prepare uh, for this episode. So Virgil's right. Uh, we invest a lot of, uh, uh, not just time, but a lot of our own resources uh, financially to, pre to prepare for these episodes, to, to rightly divide the word of truth up against these topics. So I went on and ordered 12 books on Amazon. Uh, what you're going to hear me, I'm done with my preparation for that episode, but Virgil is just now beginning his. I think I emailed Virgil like 15 pages of notes. <laughs> Um, is that on, what that on, was? That was yeah, that's, what, that's what that email was. Bro. Oh, you okay. might want to open that email, bro. Open that up and take you it might want to open yeah. that one. Um, so yeah, so I emailed Virgil 15 pages of notes on my end. 
um, from my side, I'm quoting 17 different theologians in that episode, just from the reading that I've done. So now Virgil's getting to work on, on his end. And what happens is, is when I send Virgil my notes, we both develop our content in manuscript form. So every word you hear when you press play is written down. It's in, it's in manuscript form. We have every single word written down. And as I prepare my notes, I have places within my commentary where Virgil will come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I send him my notes, he sees what my thesis is, he sees what my argument is, and he sees where he needs to come in. Right. That's why you never hear us talking over one another, because I've got designated spaces for him to come in. Now, we have moments where we ad lib and kind of go off of our notes uh, periodically, but for the most part, <clears throat> all that stuff is structured. So when I send my notes uh, to Virgil, Virgil knows, okay, now it's time for him to get to work. However much time he thinks he may need, that we will build that time into the date that we're going to release the episode. So I just emailed, me, emailed my notes to him last week. I'm thinking Verge probably needs about three weeks to get ready. <clears throat> so we built that three weeks in. I'll text Verge. I said, okay, Verge, for this three weeks that you may need, I think that puts us out. Maybe we can record the episode on July 9th. What do you think? He'll look at his calendar. Boom. Okay, we're good. All right, got it. We set the record date, we set the record time. The release date is always the following Wednesday. So we're gonna record this episode on July 9th. It's gonna be released on July 13th. And, and, and the cool thing about it is that when I send Virgil my notes, he sees what I'm gonna say. But he never sends me his notes. <laughs> he never sends, I never know. When we hit record on that scheduled date and time, I never know what he's gonna say, yeah. never. And there's a reason for that. There, there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a couple of dynamics that are happening when I get his notes. He's got a very methodical, thought-out process. And, and usually, he already told you, he's got 17 different quotes in the, in, you know, 17 different theologians alone that he's quoting. In order to maintain some fluidity, I can't come back in with, with 20 more quotes, right? In order to maintain fluidity, I've got to think through where he's going and what I need to do to help you breathe when you hear that uh, podcast. When, you, when he comes with a, with a quote that's you know, a, a paragraph long, I've gotta think, okay, do I need to help them process what was just said? Are there points that were made that I need to reiterate? Or is there a completely different direction that I need to take so that it can illuminate what's taken place? And so while I didn't do this early on and I, I was, I kicked myself for not doing it. When, early on when we started, I would, my, my, he told you he's the writer, I'm not the writer. I would use bullet points. So I would bullet point my ideas and just kind of be very extemporaneous, which was great and it helped, the, you know, helped with the flow of, of, and continuity of our conversation. The problem with it became uh, when we started taking our uh, transcripts and putting them into manuscript form for preparation for a book, right? So the first book, they're like, where are your notes? And I said, oh, they're bullet points. Well, we can't, I mean, I was, what's a bullet point going to do for that, right? So we had to go back through and then manuscript things. So, so that, that, was, that took a lot longer to get the first book out. But the, the other piece of it is I'll, I, I try, once I get his notes, to think of a different direction that he's not seeing or thinking. And for the most part, uh, I try to operate in, in a pastoral framework. Um, yeah, I'm the more prophetic voice of the two, so I'm Dar always hitting the, the, the truth aspect. Daryl is going to is going to hit you with truth real hard in your face, and, and I try to think about it through a pastoral lens. How can I not soften the truth, but but frame it in a way that that helps bring someone along for where we're going? So he's got the application piece. Yeah. Okay. So I'm the doctrine guy. He's the application piece of it. You you hear that distinctly in our. Uh, most recent episode on a biblical response to perfectionism, where it's, it's, it's a three-hour biblical counseling session. So if, if you know anyone who's dealing with the sin of perfectionism in their life, you want to turn them on to that episode. It's a three-hour biblical counseling session on perfectionism where, I, where you hear our distinct uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, I'm more prophetic. This guy right here is more uh, pastoral, more application. Uh, but uh, we, we warn people at the top of that episode that this is not going to be a comfortable episode for you to listen to. 
if you're dealing with that issue in your life because like any biblical counseling session, you're, you're trying to identify what the heart issue is. Because perfectionism is no different. There's a heart issue at play here that you need to identify and deal with. So we walk you through that, but you hear our distinct voices as you, as you listen La to that. Last so. thing I'll say about this, and then we'll get back to more of the questions, is, is there's a, a, if you're thinking <clears throat> about podcasts or doing a podcast, and, and or listening to us and kind of are thinking about what's the secret sauce, I don't know that there is any. Um, I will simply say, um, he, I've always thought of our partnership, and Daryl's been gracious. Daryl has, <clears throat> has never said, well, you, you only get so much time, or I gotta make sure, it, there's ne that, that, that never <laughs> happens. Uh, Daryl, when, when, we, when we turn the microphones on, he can't wait to hear what I'm gonna say, and I know what he's gonna say, but I can't wait to hear him deliver what he's going to say. And so there's still that mutual, um, just kind of effervescent kind of joy to, to hear in two brothers talk about things, but in my mind, just so that you know, I try to think whatever he's delivered, I need to be about 40% of that. So I'm thinking when I'm preparing 60, 40, 60% of his voice needs to be heard, 40% of mine needs to be heard as a co-host. Some people do 80, 20, some people do 90, 10. I try to balance it about in that, that range. So if I see he's, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll do a word count if I'm gonna manuscript. I'll do a word count, I'll see, okay, in that section, uh, he had a thousand words. Okay, whatever I say needs to come in at 600. So I've literally done that at times to just make sure that, that, that there's a balance of, of matching. That's probably way more than you ever want to know about that. But. All right, we, we don't have three hours to get through the rest sorry, of Sorry, brother, I'm sorry. <laughs> you boys need to pick up the pace a little bit. I'm sorry, yeah, All right, yeah. here we go. Why do you think the New Testament does not directly address slavery as a sin? It does address it. It does address it. It directly addresses it. Um, Virg, you may be better to, to, to respond to this question than me, but I think the question gets into the area of, uh, you know, Bible study methods. How do you go about Bible studying the Bible? How do you go about uh, the process of hermeneutics? How do you deal with exegesis, mm -hmm. exposition, and things of that nature? Because fundamentally, I think that's, the, that's what the question gets to. The, 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 the Bible does uh, directly address slavery, and it addresses it as a sin issue. So the, the, question, uh, the question needs to be reframed, because the issue isn't slavery, the issue is the sin that leads to slavery, that led to slavery. So you, you, you have to root cause, what you're, what, you're, what you're dealing with in that question is the, the fruit of the root. And you need to deal with the root. Yeah. You need to deal with the root. Um, the Bible, from cover to cover, directly addresses slavery. Now, because you don't see in Exodus 20, thou shalt not commit slavery, that doesn't mean the Bible doesn't address it. The Bible does address it. It's a sin issue. And if the Bible does anything, nothing else, it addresses the sin in our hearts. I, I tried to, to address that in the message that I just gave, um, in that section where, you know, talking about Jupiter Hammond, talking about... Um, uh, uh, quoting from uh, David Eltis in the Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade, share my own uh, ancestral um, uh, realities with, uh, with, with slaves and slavery. But yeah, the New Testament does address directly slavery because it addresses the sin issue that resulted mm -hmm. in that sin. And, uh, and I think, Virgil, I think it was you who said uh, at some point uh, today, <clears throat> slavery has been a global issue for thousands of years. Yeah. It's going on right now as we sit here. So slavery has not been uh, uh, eliminated uh, throughout the world, but the New Testament does address, and so does the Old Testament, by the way. Um, I think our culture is so reactionary, we're so emotional, we're so sentimental, where when we hear words like slavery, we automatically default to an Uncle Tom situation, where we think of somebody being whipped, or beating or beaten or abused, and there definitely was that. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the thing about scripture when it comes to slavery, when you look at it, the Bible doesn't outlaw slavery. It doesn't prohibit it. What it prohibits is the maltreatment yes. of your slaves. Um, historically, slavery was, I don't care if you want to call it slavery or servitude, whatever word you want to use, in many cases, those situations were the only opportunities for many men and, and women 
and children to maintain a standard of living so that they can remain alive. They weren't employable in certain occupations or jobs or things like that because they weren't skilled. <clears throat> um, those cases were rare, but we've got to we we we've got to remove ourselves from these default reactionary responses to where when we hear the word slavery, we think only on the worst case scenarios. Not all. Matter of fact, most slavery was not that. So the Bible addresses the maltreatment of your slaves, because even slaves were image bearers of God. Uh, so, um, you know, that question is a very, um, it's a very important question, but the question itself needs to be exegeted a little bit to get the context. I would, I would add a couple of things to that quickly, and I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I, I, I watch for time. Two things, one is the Old Testament actually does deal with it directly from a standpoint of, of man stealing, right? You have that kind of KJV language, Exodus 20, it, it's, it, it really forbids uh, the stealing. And, and what you're talking about with, with chattel slavery, particularly here in the United States and what that looked like, that, were, that was people who went into a land, stole a man, brought him here, put him in chains, and enslaved him. The issue of, of slavery uh, in, in the Old Testament, when you see culturally speaking, people sold themselves uh, in, in, in the indentured servitude mm -hmm. uh, in the Old Testament. It was a very natural part of, of, the, uh, of the culture of the time. And so we have only one view of slavery, and that's what blacks experienced here in the United States of America. Uh, you also have uh, 1 Timothy uh, 1.10, uh, that where, where Paul, in, in writing to Timothy, actually uh, calls slave traders immoral. These same slave traders would be the ones that are kind of looked at in the Old Testament as man-stealers. So the, the, the text does address uh, the, the nature of, of what we would talk about here in America as, as chattel slavery, uh, the, the manner in which it, it was encountered. But the, but the point of, of Scripture wasn't to clear up slavery. The point of scripture was a, a story about, about a, a sovereign God who would send his son to redeem mankind and, and, and save us from the, from the true slavery that would lead to eternal death in hell. And so as a result of that, that message is the message that's focused upon and, and with the hope that people's hearts will be transformed by the power of that gospel and they will engage in things that dehumanize other image bearers of God. Finally, I'll say this, you've got the, the, uh, the, the book of uh, Philemon or, or the story of rather Philemon, at, at, who was a slave leaves and Paul tells him to, to go back and tells the, 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 the slave and the slave master how to, how to engage one another. So you have Christianity being the first of a worldview that tells slave and slave owner that they are brothers in Christ Equals. and need to treat one another in that manner. So there's all kinds of things that you can look at from the text. I think that the point that Daryl is, is making is it, it takes someone responsibly exegeting the text, unpacking it, for the clarity of truth that's therein. So I hope that helps. Yeah, okay, now as we see more and more men whom are once trusted, and we're gonna talk about this more in just a moment, begin to sort of go off the beam, head in a trajectory that makes us uncomfortable. If a pastor or author that you have read and heard turns to embrace an unbiblical idea, at what point do you abandon any helpful materials that they have produced? Man. Because yeah, we got guys that produce good materials, yep. sometimes volumes produced by ministries, yep. and now they're wavering on some of these issues, yep. embracing it. Yep. What point do we just walk away from it and and turn our nose up? At yeah, it? I, I think I think there, are, I think that's a challenging question because I think there are categories for these kinds of things, right? I, I, and again, I I don't want to I'm going to share with you kind of how I view this, but I wouldn't prescribe this as hey, follow, here's what I do, follow me, right? Because there's there's still aspects of this that I'm working out. A similar question that, that Daryl and I were asking as we watched the whole woke thing unfold is when do we begin calling these people, these, these men who, mm -hmm. who have been, when do we begin, we begin calling them unbelievers? Right? When they're preaching a different gospel, they're, they're, they're advocating ideas that are anti-biblical, and they're embracing a, a, a worldview that, that doesn't match what Scripture is talking when, when do we finally challenge it and say they're unbelievers? And so, that's, I, what, that's what Galatians is all about. I think, I, think that's, I think that's challenging. So the, the way I kind of view that, I, I, I'll give you an example of what I, what, what I demonstrated here, okay? Today, when I gave my talk, I quoted who? Dr. Martin Luther King, right? A trusted hero and, and, and really an iconic figure. Uh, but I, I said we should, we should have problems with his theology, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because it was off, it was wrong. I even went so far as to say I don't believe that Martin Luther King was a, was a Christian, but under the umbrella of common 
grace, whether believer or not believer, you can speak truth about, about an issue, a, 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 a situation, a circumstance. You can speak that truth and we can advocate that truth as something that, that it coincides with the biblical worldview while, while identifying the wrongness of that man. I think I would, in light of a, of a believer, a man that we've trusted, I would do the same kind of thing. I would say, listen, here's someone who, who has maybe some good material. I, I, at, this, at the point at which they've gone off the rail, I don't um, promote their works. I would not promote, uh, you would not see me advocate, hey, go, go buy this. Hey, go, go, go <clears throat> for the purpose of your own, our own soul's protection. Mm -hmm. I would not advocate doing that. I would simply say that, that you know, this person has written some good material. If you came to me and asked me, and that's usually the, how, yeah. how this happens. This is not a, I'm on a, 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 a Facebook page or a, or a live and I'm telling you uh, about, uh, uh, let's just call it out. I'm not telling you about nine marks of a healthy church. On a, on, a, on, a, on a Facebook post or in some space and place because I, I know what, what, what Dever now, where he is, what he stands for, what, what he's promoting in the way of, of, a, of a gospel that's, that, that, that's tainted, right? Uh, and, and by that, what I mean is simply the, 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 the wokeism that's invaded things at Capitol Hill, uh, what he's allowed to take place in that space. And I've got the quotes and can do all of that, but I just, I, I personally would not promote that work in an open space, I would not. Now, if someone were to come to me with the book and say, is this a good book? Should I be reading this? Mm -hmm. I would say, listen, you're free to read what you want. However, here's where this man is in error. Here's where some things are wrong. And you need to be aware of that and know that for your own soul's yeah. safety. So that would be the manner in which I would, I would operate that. Again, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't prescribe that. Uh, I'm just telling you how I navigate that very challenging and difficult issue. Yeah, I would just add... Uh, I'm sorry, V, when you brought up Dr. King, it just occurred to me. Any of you who are interested in reading and studying Dr. King's um, theological worldview or his worldview in general, you can do a Google search. Just, just search Martin Luther King Jr. Stanford University. Stanford University has a partnership with the King Center in Atlanta where you have many of Dr. King's papers online at Stanford University website. Many of his papers going all the way back yes. to when he was in seminary at Crozier Theological Seminary back in the 40s. So you can read a lot of his own words, a lot of his writings while he was in seminary where you get a clear picture of what his theological worldview is. And when you read those, depending on how thoroughly you want to read them, you come to the understanding that Christian was, uh, sorry, King was not a biblical regenerate Christian. He was more of a moralist. He was more of a humanist. He was more of a globalist because he partnered. It was more of an ecumenicist. He partnered with Hindus, Buddhists, um, uh, Middle Eastern religionists. Um, to, to, he was a, matter of fact, in his sermon uh, titled, I'm sorry, a paper that he wrote a seminary titled Preaching Mission, he said, and I'm quoting, I am a staunch advocate of the social gospel, unquote. Yeah. So King was a, so, he, he was a uh, social gospel conformist. Uh, he was more of a moralist, uh, a humanist than a uh, biblical uh, well, he, Christian. He named Walter Rauschenbusch as one of his largest influences, right. if that would tell you anything. All right, how do you decide whether to engage in debate and confrontation on social media, and at what point do you cease from debating? I, I, I don't debate people on social media. Um, I, I simply put what, I, what I'm thinking or an idea that I have, I push it forward and call it a day. Now, what I may do for fun <laughs> is I may engage somebody who's you know, being a knucklehead or I, I've got 15 minutes to waste, this will be fun. Um, but but it's, it's, it's never for the purpose. And, and here's, and l let me say this, I, 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 will, I will never be disrespectful to someone to the, to the degree that I've called them a, a name or a pejorative or something like that. But I, but I will make fun of what they've said or, or, or something that, that they've shared that's an idea. I will, I will expose that for its foolishness for its folly. I will do that, but, but I, I usually don't resort to name calling. That's kind of, that's kind of childish behavior. I do think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a way to, to operate from a standpoint of, of social media etiquette uh, that I think as believers we should all demonstrate. Now, uh, am I perfect at it? Absolutely not. And if, you ever, and if you ever see me demonstrating it in such a way that that's not the case, feel free to, to, to check me, call me on it, and, and uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, to, to make that right. But that's kind of my my MO with social media. Yeah, I apply that same MO um, as well. I don't, uh, I don't debate people on social media. I don't think I'm on. Am I on? You might, your battery might be shot. Yeah, my battery Is that it? Battery shot? 
Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at Proverbs 26, 5. <clears throat> Proverbs 26, 5 says, Answer a fool as his folly right. deserve, that he be not wise in his own eyes. That's what I employ uh, on social media, especially if any of you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen me do this. What I'll do is I'll ridicule the idea. I'll ridicule the comment. I'll never ridicule the person. Um, so a system that I've come up with, I, I have a, a, a clown emoji that I like to use. And I'll, I'll award you any, from anywhere between one and five clowns, depending on how stupid your comment is. So depending on how absurd your comment is, you know, for the absolutely, incredibly, astoundingly absurd, you get five clowns. <laughs> if it's only you know, minimally absurd, minimally stupid, you'll get one clown. So that's what I'll do. I'll just quote you, quote tweet you, and I'll drop a series of clowns. And I've done that so often now that people know, people get it. They're familiar with my clown scale. <laughs> they've actually come to copy it themselves uh, to where they'll go by and, and, and award uh, a certain number of clowns. But it's only to ridicule the idea. It's only to ridicule the comment in the context of Proverbs 26.5. I never... Uh, make fun of an individual. I never call someone a fool. I never call someone an idiot. I never do that. But the ideas that they approach us with and trying to, to hook us into a debate, a debate. Or argument. We won't do I'll it. Just, I'll just let them, I'll quote to them so the world can see how asinine what, what they're saying is, and then I'll award them a series of clowns. Right. Yeah. All right. As a Christian author, I want to promote biblical truth and combat wokeness. I'm concerned about cancel culture being silenced. Or I'm concerned about cancel culture and being silent sure. and, and doing that. Do you have any advice or encouragement for Christians facing cancel culture? Yeah, we, we, I mean, we're trying to think through those pieces of the puzzle at, at G3. Uh, we have a YouTube page. We've got a lot of content that I just uploaded on there. We've got all of our archive material that, that, uh, that's been sitting in different spaces that now has gotten there. And we, we're, I mean, we're concerned that the, we, none of what we do is a shying away of of truth, right? Of, of, of whether it's biblical sexuality uh, or wokeism or anything, and uh, you know, so we have the concern of of um, you know what happens if we've got this stuff on the YouTube page and all of a sudden it's gone. And so we just our thought process is just doubling our efforts in spaces and places so that we never lose the material. But we anticipate. My thought would be expect that to take place. I mean, you, you should expect to be canceled at some point. You should expect to be, uh, you, you should expect the persecution that scripture says that you're going to endure for, for living a life that, that's, you know, that, that chooses to honor God. And so with that said, I just would, would make sure that I, I did whatever it, it, whatever it took to have duplicates, triplicates of what you need, where you need it, so that people can access it. And the more you can get off of those kinds of platforms and at least have your own um, you know, your, your own resource. For example, I think it'd be wise uh, for you to have your own app with all of your materials on it accessible. So, I mean, that's what GTY does. That's what G3 does. We, we have our own, own application. Now, that, that, that's not going to stop Google from shutting you down, as, as, as can be the case. Uh, but, but your hope is to try to navigate what you can, staying connected with those who want to connect with you uh, in a way that, that, that's, that's helpful. But you, you cannot operate from a standpoint of fear. You, you really cannot. You've got to go forward, preach the truth, tell the truth, and, and, and believe God for the rest. So. Yeah, I really agree with that practical counsel there, Virg. As a matter of fact, I'm reading uh, Matthew 5. Um, I would just encourage that person to, number one, guard your mind and heart against what Virgil just said. Guard, guard your mind and heart against falling into an attitude and a mindset of fear, mm -hmm. anxiety. Guard your mind and heart against that um, I would encourage you to go back and listen to our podcast episode that's titled, Why Are You Afraid? Yes. Uh, go back and look at that. That's the episode upon which the book is, is based. But I would encourage you to go to Matthew 5 and read, what Jesus, read the words of Jesus, especially the latter part, <clears throat> verse 12, where, he, where Jesus says, when you are persecuted and insulted, rejoice. Mm -hmm. That's the attitude you should have. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And I also would encourage you to go look at Philippians chapter 1, verse, verse 29, yeah. where it says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer, suffer for, for his sake. sake. So if you're in that situation, don't be concerned, don't be anxious, rejoice. Be glad, be happy that... The grace of Christ has shined upon you to where in his providence and in his uh, sovereignty, he has chosen providentially to 
permit this situation uh, to come to fruition in your life, and you should rejoice in that. Mm -hmm. All right, I have, <clears throat> I have a black friend who has adopted many tenets of CRT, and I want to help lead him to a biblical position. Any advice or counsel for how I can help him? No. no I, I'm only half kidding. Um, uh, you, I don't, I don't, that's a difficult question yeah. to answer. I don't know all the dynamics of the situation, uh, and there's no one, one answer fits all scenario that I can give you. There's not one thing that's going to work with every black person so that now you have the, the black person answer that you can go and <laughs> take care of the, of that, the black person the black card. Person card. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have that. I would need black a, person alert, black person alert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would need a lot more information to, to, to deal with that. I would simply in a general sense, uh, you know, tell you that, that all of that is, is about relationship. You know, how are you, how are you interacting? What are you, what are you saying? What do those conversations look like? One of the, one of the, the keys that I tried to give you while, while I, while I had an opportunity to speak is that the more that you can engage in those kinds of conversations devoid of emotion, the better off you are. That, 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 that's a better position. That's a better circumstance from which to operate. If you're operating from a standpoint of you, you can't wait to jump, jump in and nobody's going to want to deal with you, right? If, if that, or you're not that way and they start talking and you feel yourself just going, just stop. Just stop. Figure something else out because you're not ready for that conversation. I will tell you, being here is important. Uh, being in spaces like this is important. Why? Because you're getting information that you wouldn't have otherwise. And that information is always helpful. I think more information helps you to calm down. I, I, when, I, when I would teach apologetics classes, I would tell people um, that, that, would, that would have the tendency to get riled up in situations. I said, listen, have you ever argued a, about the fact that, that two and two is four? I mean, have you ever gotten to a heated debate? Well, no. Well, why? Well, because you, you know that two and two is four. Now, again, I, I know that there's a whole world of crazy critical thinking right now that's saying two and two is five, right? But no one's going to get wound up about that debate. Why? Because you know the truth. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the more truth you have and know, the calmer you can be because it's not about you. Um, it, it's about a defense of the truth. And so you can operate from that vantage point. That's probably more than more to that than, than I could, than I need to say. Yeah, with. I'll just add, Virgil really just kind of hit on it. My counsel to you would just be to be careful what your motives are. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I thought the key word in the question was help. If you truly want to help the individual, then you'll take yourself and your bias out of it, take your position out of it. If you really want to help the person, uh, make sure that the manner in which you approach them to help them um, is, is rooted in pure motives, rooted in godly motives. You're not trying to win an argument. You're trying, not trying to win a debate. What you're trying to do is present them with the truth of the gospel, and, and then you, what you do is just do that, stick to that, and then trust God to work his word in the heart and mind of that person if he so chooses. But you need to take yourself out of the situation, <clears throat> be as objective as possible, and make sure your motives are right in wanting to help the person. And then uh, you, you're not uh, in the position of, uh, you know, fidgety and going all emotionally uh, berserk uh, in that situation. You've removed yourself from it. What's at stake here is the truth of the gospel. You help them. Uh, you share with them as much as possible, but do it objectively, um, but with a pure motive and intention. And I'll let you answer this one because it's more kind of your people. Okay. Next SBC president, Askell or Barber? Askell. If he wins, will some of the churches that have left the SBC come back? No, for oh. clarity, the church that you are part of has left the F SBC, right? Praise Mill Baptist. Yes, Praise Mill Baptist. Is you're no longer Praise Mill Baptist. Now you're Praise Mill church? No, Praise Mill Baptist. Oh. We, 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 How that, can you be a Baptist church and not be not part be, of the SBC? Not be SBC. We, we, were, we, were as, we were Baptist before the SBC was. That's how that works. Oh. Our church is older. So they should be joining you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The, the, the <clears throat> Praise Mill Baptist Church was, be, was, was uh, uh, put in place or was in place as a, as a church, uh, I want to say at least four or five years before the SBC actually uh, formed itself. And so um, we're, we're, we're good. Uh, if you're interested in, in why Dr. Josh Bice has written an article that you can go to g3men.org and he, he 
articulates his thought process very well. In fact, Justin uh, Peters had him on um, his, his uh, podcast, and uh, he did a fantastic job of, A, asking the right kinds of questions and unpacking that. So if you're interested in why the church and what the process looked like for the church to leave the SBC, uh, you, can, you can see what that is. But, but again, we, we've got friends who are still connected. Uh, you know, I, I, I was a pastor, an associate pastor at a church that was SBC. There are good people who are still in the SBC. I wish the SBC well. There's no ill feelings or harm that, that we wish them. I do hope uh, that, that Tom Askell is the next president. But even if he is the next president, um, the, the, the sentimentalism and pragmatism, which we'll talk about some tomorrow, that has infected the SBC will take 10 years at least to bring it back to, you know, to, to, uh, back to par, right? Back to zero. And then it will take another 10 years to push it into a, a reformed uh, idea about worship where, where scripture is sufficient to inform all that we do in every facet of, of worship and life. And so, and, and, and Tom is very aware, this isn't a, hey, I won, it's over, y'all come back. It's, it's, a, it's a process, right? The conservative resurgence took 25 years to unfold and people who were there for, for a lengthy period of time making sure that, that every, every uh, uh, committee member was placed in the right positions so that the conservatives could win. This is not a one and done situation with the SBC. So it'll be a part of a process I wish Tom, nothing but the best. We're both Daryl and I have, have our, our book was uh, printed with Founders Press, which which is over, uh, which is which uh, Tom Askell uh, is over. We have a, a great relationship with them. We'll continue to have that. I, I think I I texted Tom or sent something out or tweeted him or, or something today, and just to encourage him as he's going through the process. We pray for him. Uh, we we pray for for things to change and turn around uh, in the SBC. But uh, it's a long process. And um, so, question. Is it yes or no? Short, short, short answer. Yep, yep, yep. Yes or no? Is the SBC beyond repair? Oh wow, it's more than a yes or no. I mean, no, no, it's a yes or no question. <laughs> I mean, it either is or it isn't. If it isn't, there's no need to explain it. If there is, there's, it's, it's self-evident. Yes or no? Is it beyond repair? I, I, I here's what I would say to that in in, in this public setting. Um, I, I would say that for me and the and the role that I played in that space. And what I've, what I've experienced and seen in that space, I, I don't believe I'm qualified to make a, a, a judgment like that. Are you qualified? I'm not qualified, but my answer is yes. <laughs> it's beyond repair. <laughs> it's beyond repair. Yeah. It's, it's beyond repair. I, I, I just, I, 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 I'm, maybe, maybe here's, where, here's where I come from. I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I'm hopeful. I, I, I don't want to see it. I don't, you don't want the answer to be yes. No, I don't. I don't want the answer. Yeah. To be, I don't want no. the answer. To no, be yes. I don't think anybody does want yeah. the answer. Yeah, to yeah I don't want the answer to be yes. But no. if it's yes, no question. I'm answering yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We lived in Georgia for six years and struggled with Sunday being the most segregated day of the week. What effective biblical responses have you seen to unifying the white, black, Hispanic, etc. church within the same city? Two things. One, the gospel. Two is the idea that that. Uh, the idea that posited this quote, we did an entire episode mm -hmm. on this quote mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. uh, when we were at uh, G3. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the, uh, if you want to hear the lengthy hour-long version, uh, it's called Woke Church. And then we, t we circled back and did, and did Woke Church Part 2. So if you want to go hear those, hear a lengthy answer to that question, you can. Simply to say that, that the quote comes from Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, and, and the quote in and of itself is, is not an accurate assessment of what's actually taking place in the church. 12 o'clock is not the most segregated hour, right? And not from a standpoint of, of you not being able to go and experience church wherever you... There's no church that I can't walk into as a black man. When you're talking about segregation, you're talking about a law that requires me to stay on the side of a street, to, to drink from a specific fountain, to do some specific things. Now, if people are choosing to go where they're located in a particular city to a specific church, that's a choice you're making. Segregation is something that was enforced. So the idea that, that, that it's the most segregated hour, that's a nice little quote to, that, that, that King popularized, 
but it's, it's not an accurate assessment of where we are today. That's a, the idea behind that is a reproblematizing. You've heard us use that word. It's a reproblematizing of something that took place historically speaking as if it's the same way today, and that's absolutely not the case. Now, the other aspect of the question, which is, uh, you know, what do we do to, to, to fix the, the, the segregation? Again, my premise would be people are choosing to go where they go based upon what they desire to do. They're not forced to do so. They're free to, I was free to walk into this church. I had no inhibitions about doing that. There was no sign on the wall that kept that from taking place. So I, I go where I want to. And if someone is staying at an all black church, it's because that's what they choose to do. It's not because, it's not because that's the only place that they can go. Uh, they can go wherever they, they choose to go. So I, I, the, the nature of the question, I think it needs to be, it needs to be looked at from a standpoint of how it's framed. And because it, 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 based upon how it's framed, it, it, it then posits the next idea, which is this is a problem, right? Now, what can we do to fix it? And my argument there would be there's nothing for you to fix. The church is not yours. It's Christ. So what you and I are to do is we're to go and be obedient to what the word says, which is to go and preach the gospel to all men. And as, they, as the gospel is preached, hearts will be transformed. And the power of that gospel will draw them into a church. And if you're the one that shared the gospel with them, guess where they're probably going to go? They're probably going to go to church with you. And so that'll be the opportunity. What do we do? We preach the gospel. This is, this is the kind of thinking that if we're not careful, lends itself to the idea that, A, the gospel isn't enough, and B, I've got to do something more. And, and, and those, those, those kinds of things are things we need, to, we, need to, we, need to, we need to push back against and really open the scripture and think about it. So. Yeah, I'm thinking about the episode we did on the Leave Loud movement with Jamar Tisby, yes. and, uh, who's uh, uh, spearheading that movement where he's urging uh, black evangelicals to leave uh, predominantly white churches, if that's what they are, to, to leave loud, to protest on your way out. We did an entire episode on that issue. We titled it Activist Theology. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to the episode that's titled Activist Theology. Uh, personally, one of my favorite episodes that, that we've done where we, we kind of walk you through uh, why that whole Leave Loud movement is unbiblical. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think the question presupposes, uh, uh, it's, it's presuppositional. It's presuppositional on its face. Yeah. Uh, be, the presupposition is that in order for a biblical local church to be truly biblical, it must, like we said this morning, it must represent multicolored. It must be multicolored. <clears throat> and Virgil just nailed it. The church, is, 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 the church doesn't belong to you. Um, God, every, every, truly, every true believer in Christ is by faith automatically a part of the universal church. Mm -hmm. Automatically a part of it. So what right do we have at the local church level to put these stipulations on something that Christ doesn't apply to his universal church? You become a member of the church by faith, and that occurs monogistically by God alone. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that by his doing, that is by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing. So who am I to say, well, your church at the local level needs to look like this? See, there's a difference between having a multicolored or multi-ethnic church and having a multicolored, uh, multi-ethnic congregation. <clears throat> That's good. We're in a church right now. Multiple ethnicities represented. But unless these multiple ethnicities are believers, right. you don't have a multi-ethnic church. church. Yep. The church, by definition, is comprised of believers, not attenders. So that's the distinction that we have to make. Mm -hmm. And whomever God wants to bring into his church, he's going to bring them. Absolutely. If you, if you recognize at the end of, the, at the end of my talk, I, I read from what was it, uh, Revelation 7, yeah. 9 mm -hmm. following, this idea of, of many nations, many ethnicities, that's the work of, of Christ. That's, that's the work of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All you have to do is go do what you were commissioned to do, which is to go and preach the gospel. Be faithful to the preaching of the gospel. And, 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 and all of that color stuff takes care of itself in the end. I can take you to some churches on the west side of Atlanta where I grew up. They're predominantly black churches. They're all black. They're all black. 
But this question, whenever it is raised, you touched on this earlier, Virgil, it's like the onus is always on the white church to become more dark. It's never on the dark church to become more white. Right. You know, and in the area where I grew up over there, in, uh, 30314 zip code, you're not going to find Caucasians living over there. No Hispanics live over there. No Asians live there. You know, uh, the, 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 so this whole idea, of, listen, let me just say this. <laughs> With all due respect to how God used Dr. Martin Luther King when he did and I get that. But Dr. King's, his worldview was just wrong. He throws out this statement like this from a speech that he gave. And here we are six decades later. Still talking about Still it. Still talking about Needing it. Needing to re-problematize need, it need for to re day. I mean, come on. Really? I mean, so, so the, 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 with all due respect to the questioner who lived in Georgia for six years, I lived in Georgia for all my life, with the, with the exception of the past three years. I know that state like the back of my hand. I know that city, city of Atlanta where I grew up like the back of my hand. Um, churches are not segregated because if, to say that a church is segregated presupposes a, 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 a standard or a benchmark that Christ doesn't apply That's good. to his church. Mm -hmm. So we need to get rid of this question. We just need to stop asking it with all due respect. All right. This is the last one from the audience. We had a couple others, but I'll save those because we're going to wrap them up with some other questions here in a moment. Okay. Could you please help my pastor and teach him how to tie a bow tie? <laughs> I got would, you. I got you. It would strongly compliment his fedora that his wife loves. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we could both do that. By the way, these, these ties are the ones you have to tie. Yeah, these are tie ties. These are we don't do clip-ons. Do clip All right. What do black people experience that white folk don't know about or understand? Are white people blind to racism? I, so, don't, I don't know what black I people... Have no idea. I, don't, I, don't, I don't... I have no idea. If you find out, come, come tell me tell what us, they get. Yeah. So are you profiled? Can you go for a walk without an ID? Did you have to teach your kids how to respond when an officer pulls them over? Are you treated, treated differently on the basis of your color? Are you pulled over for driving while black? Are you expected to vote a certain way? Is voter ID racist? Are, are you too incompetent to get voter ID? I have no idea. I, I, to, to every single one of those, I have no idea how to, how to respond to any of that because any, any issue that I run into related to that, I've never experienced through the lens of the color of my skin. None of it, ever. So, I mean, I even, even if someone came to me and, and said something blatantly, what we would all identify as racist, I would attribute that to they're stupid. <laughs> not, not to anything related. It says more about you than it ever says about me. So it's not even a conversation. Like, I'm not even going to spend the time entertaining what, was, what the motivation was. It was stupid. And that's about as much time as I have for that. Yeah, that's, that's a five clowner right there, man. That, yeah. that's, that's, <laughs> if, if we were on Twitter right now, that would get five, five clowns. clowns. Yeah. So you can go for a walk without ID? I You're mean, not pulled over for that reason? Nope. You've been pulled over? I have been pulled over. How'd, I, how'd I, it work out? It, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it worked out. Do you want me to tell the story? I, I do, told you? yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, I, was, I, was, I was telling Pastor Jim a story. Hey, Bert, I got to say this, man. Yes. Can you, like, give us the... The snippet? Yeah. 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 He wants me to get a snippet. Okay, let me give a snippet. I, I, uh, I got pulled over by an officer. I was headed out, driving too fast, past the stop sign, didn't stop all the way. I, the lights <clears> blow up, right? So... Apparently, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid, obviously, because I had, I had my cell phone, and I literally, the cop is behind me, and I literally, in the car, I took a picture, and the picture, I could show it to you if you want to see it, it's of my face and the lights behind me. I took the picture because I thought, dang it, this is going to be funny. <laughs> That's the real reason I took the picture. I took the picture, and I put it down. And then he comes up, we do all the stuff, and, you know, you blew through the stop sign. I was like, I know I'm headed to such and such. He's like, all right, let me get your license. And I fills out the thing, comes back. And uh, I took the ticket from him, and I said, listen. This is, tw this is 2020. I said, listen, 
with the, you know, all the verdicts and all this stuff happening, and officers are getting a bad rap. And, uh, and we just had an exchange, black guy, white cop, you know, this is, this is the narrative. I said, so why don't you do me a, why don't you do me a solid and uh, let's take a picture together. I, there was absolutely no fear. I just thought this would be cool. I took a snapshot of he and I and, and uh, him giving me the ticket, took a picture. And I took that picture and I did a side by side of A, the police officer uh, car behind me and B, me and the police officer. And I'd written something up on social media thinking this is probably going to go nowhere. My friends will get a laugh at me and that'll be it. Well, this thing blows up about 80,000 likes and shares and it goes all over the country. In fact, uh, I found out later from the officer that there were police uh, stations around the country that reached out to him and, and just said, hey, great job. You know, because I basically because I had said in the piece, I said, you know, I, I didn't fear for my life. I, all the stuff that you named. I didn't fear for my life. I wasn't afraid. I, I knew I'd done wrong. I knew that all of that stuff. And uh, the exchange was respectful, but I did get the ticket, you know, and so I was trying to make a joke of it. Well, needless to say, the news media in, this, in Omaha heard about it, and they actually called me and said, hey, we want to put you and that officer together and do a news story. Uh, so they did. They did a news story. I went down and saw the guy, and we were, you know, he hugged me. He's like, man, thank you for the positive feedback. And you know, all these officers, I was like, man, that's great. But then I still had to pay for the tickets. <laughs> Ver, Ver, what I want to know is how much was the ticket? The ticket was about 100 bucks, a little over wow, 100 bro. bucks. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I paid it though. Yeah. I was in the wrong. Yeah. To what extent is your experience in America contingent on the color of your skin? I have no idea. That depends on the individual. I have no idea. Like I have no, I don't, there's, there's not like, okay, I'll be right back. You know, I'm keeping record. Let me look, let me check my records. <laughs> I, that's not, I, I don't, I, I don't have that. Like I don't, <laughs> like I, I don't, I have no answer for that. Was that you, I didn't even know that was that funny. I your just life thought, wasn't better when you were a white man. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So you have no bar by which to no. judge. <laughs> no, I didn't I didn't I've been black my whole life. I don't have a <laughs> I'll be right back. Let me check my records of how this has been how this has been Ooh. going. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, on February 27th, it was Racial Reconciliation Sunday in the Yeah, S in the so are you, we all reconciled. Did y'all know that on April? <laughs> We're all reconciled. Did y'all know the SBC reconciled us all on that day? He the nomination did it. The nomination did it. Looky there. Wave that magic wand. Y'all are reconciled. <laughs> I saw that, and I could not believe that they were doing that. It was yes. Racial Reconciliation Day. So let me finish the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> This is going to come as a shock to most people, but I saw both of you post negative Twitter comments on that subject. What's the issue with that? Are you opposed to racial reconciliation? I am, actually. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. am. I am opposed yeah. to it. Both, I mean, we it's both, nonsense. It's nonsense. We both subscribe to the idea that racists don't reconcile hearts do. Uh, in fact, Daryl coined that, and then I, I, I took it a step further when, I, when we were uh, in being interviewed by Ali Beth Stuckey and, just, uh, and gave the example of, okay, let's say that this is a real thing, right? Who, who is the black representative that's going to represent all black people? And then who, who's y'all's white representative that you're going to send to reconcile on behalf of all white people? What are going to be the terms of the reconciliation, and how will it be reported to us all that we've now been fully reconciled? Do you see how silly this all is? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day... And reconcile from what? Absolutely. Reconcile from what? So if this whole idea of racial reconciliation, I think I made that clear my position on it in the message that I just gave, yeah. the whole idea of racial reconciliation is totally nonsensical. So for instance, let's pretend today is racial Re reconciliation Friday. <laughs> What are we, what are Jim and I being reconciled over? <laughs> yeah, that could be an issue, but we, we, we don't need to be reconciled over that. So, so the point I'm trying to make is this. The whole idea of reconciliation, presu reconciliation presupposes that there is an objective issue of conciliation that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. What, recon what the idea of racial reconciliation bids you do first above everything else is to acknowledge who this person is based on the color of their skin. 
That's what the racial and racial reconciliation forces you to do. That's it the very problem at the heart of the Exactly the right. So white people, go find a black person to reconcile with them. <laughs> black people, go find a white person and reconcile with them. Just because they're white. It makes no sense. It's and just the and, dumbest and, thing. And my hope is that, I hope everywhere we go, to debunk this to the degree that every time you see it, you laugh. It's five clowns. You laugh. <laughs> Every time you see it, you just throw it. You, you, that's it's just, garbage. It's that's ridiculous. ridiculous. All right. This is the last one for tonight. And then uh, we got some more to ta tackle tomorrow. What is happening in our seminaries, in our churches, in our denominations? We used to have uh, coalitions around the gospel. People used to get together for the gospel. And now some of these people who have gotten together there, for the gospel and coalesced, coalesced around the gospel right. are embracing some of the very things that you guys are here criticizing and taking issue with. And that is not how it should be. And that's not how it was even 10 years ago. Right. So there is a drift taking place. Right. Would we call it an apostasy? What's happening in... What's happening? What's going on on the large scale? Well, I think they were, I think, I think they were captured, those organizations you mentioned... Uh, were captured in this wave uh, uh, with, with regard to wokeism, and they went there, and, and really it caused, it caused the downfall of one and the teetering of the other. Um, the, the, the issue really now is what's happening, what, what's happening in their, uh, it, what they're doing to rebrand themselves, right? So, so what, what, what TGC is doing to rebrand itself is they're trying to find this middle ground. So they'll do a video now where you've got both sides, someone who's a proponent of, of, of CRT, someone who's antagonistic against CRT, and they'll be, they'll be kind of going at it in a, in a debate, right? You see this, this format where, where they get all of their issues out and they get all their issues out, and then they sit down and talk, and it's not really a debate. Uh, in fact, if you watch the, the quote-unquote debate, uh, it's a man who steps up, who, who's supposed to be standing against CRT. See, they won't ask a Daryl Harrison to come debate. They won't ask a Virgil Walker, a Bodie Bauckham to come and have these kinds of conversations and set it up in the real debate format. They won't ask a James White who can handle himself in that space to come and debate these issues because that's not really what they're after. What they're now after in these arenas are for, for you to be, they're really wanting to be tone police. And so now the, the, the issue is thou shalt be nice, right? It, it, it's, it's, never, it's never about what's right and wrong about the issues and the subject matter. It's, oh, you've, you had some good points and you said it in a, in a nice way. And, oh, you had some good points and you said it in a nice way. Now, what would you say to the people who are on your side that they could do better to be nice? And that's the conversation that's now being had. So it's this kind of third wave niceness that's, that's supposed to permeate all of what we say rather than saying, no, there's some real distinctions here that need to be talked about, even passionately if need be, in an effort to examine what scripture has to say about these. And either we need to accept one and reject the other or accept the other and reject the one. But we're going to stand for something regardless. And that's not what's actually happening. There's a rebranding that's actually taking place that you're going to see uh, happen. That, that, they, they recognize woke, wokeness will leave you broke. They recognize that. So now the next step in the phase is a rebranding of, 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 of things. It's kind of the, the, the idea, hey, we went, we went too far here. We went too far. Here's the middle ground that we can find ourselves in and, and, uh, and proceed forward. There's, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of uh, terminologies and jargon around that. I won't, I won't bore you with all of that uh, this evening, but, but just know that that's what's happening and that's what you're going to be seeing moving so forward. Yeah, to, to that note, just real quick, Jim, yeah. uh, to, to Virgil's point, I would encourage you to go back and listen to our episode titled A Nuanced Gospel, mm -hmm. because this is what happened. What Virgil just described is the integration of nuance as the new um, um, hermeneutic, nuance, and the irony is that anything, nothing that's nuanced can be hermeneuticized, if that's a word, uh, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to do, use nuance as a play on a way to uh, offer a more uh, palatable hermeneutic so as to make the gospel less offensive, make standing for truth less offensive under the guise of what I call the 11th commandment, that thou shalt be nice. So check out our episode, uh, A Nuanced Gospel. So in, in all of the Gospel Coalition events, mm -hmm. 
uh, that they have and all of the Together for the Gospel events that they have combined, how many times have you guys been asked to come speak? Zero. And again, I, I, I don't know at this point because of what they stand for that I would take an invitation uh, from them. It would be, it, I, I, would, I would question why I was there, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, Dal, Dal nor I seek a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've never been one to seek a platform trying to get somewhere or, or be, I mean, that's not how we operate. We're grateful for any opportunity that we have and we try to deliver uh, something that's beneficial for all those who are who are, are listening. So we're not chasing anyone's platform. Um, at the end of the day, we just we, we want to do what we talked about, which is just stand for truth. Yeah. Um, we want to be about that. And if if you hear us and believe that what we bring is going to be of value, then then then, then there's mutual benefit in that. And if not, we're fine with that. We don't. We're, we're not. We're, neither of us are losing sleep because we haven't received an invitation from them. But I, I do recognize who they do platform and what they do platform, and that gives me all the information I need to know exactly where they're going. Yep, yep. All right, uh, one last thing. Josh? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what, what is he up to? Uh-oh. What? What? I'm afraid of what's going to jump out of it. So. Wow. Right. It's a clown. It's five clowns. Five little clowns. <laughs> oh, that's good. Would you please open that up for us? I don't know if I want to open this thing, man. I, it's not that I don't trust you, Jim. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> Watch Black Lives Matter say, oh, that's a noose. <laughs> <laughs> if you call it a noose, we could have 15 FBI agents here tomorrow right. investigating it. Right, that. right. <laughs> Dude, somebody, somebody went in somebody on that. Somebody knew what they were doing. Wow, that's impressive. I had to go back to the hotel with glitter all over. <laughs> Well, at least your wife's here, so she knows what's, you know. Yeah, she knew I wasn't at the club. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> she know. She know I wasn't in downtown yeah. Kootenai. Man, you don't need a knife for that. I know y'all said, man, hurry up with this. <laughs> keeping, them, keeping them in suspense, man. I'm going to need a knife for this, man. Anybody got all these, all the hundreds. Oh, snap. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Will you open Eight that? People. <laughs> oh, don't ask you. for a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in this room would have got <laughs> Yeah, don't, don't come mess with nobody here at, at Don't be JCC. messing with these people up in uh, Idaho, man. JCC, you know, they are prepared. They don't play right here. They are prepared, man. Amazon? No, y'all didn't. <laughs> no, y'all didn't. Can you hold? No, y'all didn't. Oh, my gosh. You know what they've done? What you, you know got? what they've gone and done? Man, you guys are going to make me tear up up here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. I finally got my Tonka Talk Dunk right. up. Look at that. Look at that. Did you, did you know about this? You didn't know about this? It, it, was, it was our little attempt at racial reconciliation. Man. <laughs> Once you We're said reconciled. We're reconciled. Once you said that, once you said it was my fault that you didn't have one, I thought, well, we have to do something about it. That was not my idea, but it Thank was a good Thank you all. Thing. Thank you, guys. Yeah. This is...
This is awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are done for tonight. So you are free to leave whatever you want here. Please take any valuables that you have, weapons that you have home with you. <laughs> but anything else you can leave on the tables for tomorrow and doors will open at 8 a.m. We will have food out, coffee again, and session starts at 8.45 tomorrow morning. All right, have a good night. You're dismissed. Thank you.